Chaj Ashtatara Sada Shri Shri Mahat. His divine grace abides from out of in the Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki. Is Khan found your chariot to buy in grace, she will provide key. BBT found your chariot to buy in grace, she will provide key. Savior of the whole world, his divine grace, she will provide key. Gore Premanandi. All glorious to the assembled devotees. All glorious to the assembled devotees. All glorious to the assembled devotees. All glorious, all glorious to Sri Guru, Sri Ganga, and Srila Prabhupada. No, the ground was like, uh, you know, from going to town, it was like this big. <laughs> I could wear it around my head, you know. Reading from Srila Prabhupada Lilamrita, volume 6, chapter 9. It gets a little harder to read towards the end here. Chapter titled, Krishna's Great Soldier. During the long flight, Srila Prabhupada remained solemn. His servants were helpless to alleviate the difficult situation as they might have in Vrindavan. And cigarette smoke, loud talk, and drunken laughter surrounded them. Tamal Krishna, despite his concern, did not know what to do for Srila Prabhupada or what to ask him. Srila Prabhupada had often expressed a dislike for conversations with questions like, how are you feeling? Prabhupada's servants knew that they could not fully understand their spiritual master's thinking, and the scriptures also warned that one should not attempt to understand the mind of a Vaishnava, of the Vaishnava. But they knew their service was to relieve him by arranging for quiet, by assisting him in bathing and dressing, or by taking him to the temple for darshan of Krishna Balaram. Now, however, they were helpless to perform any of these tasks now, more than ever, Srila Prabhupada was in Krishna's hands. Earlier that year in Bhubaneswar, he had said that his disciples, although willing to help, could not change the situation if he was inconvenienced by old age. And he had even given the example that although he might be in his opulent quarters at Bhaktivedanta Manor, that did not mean he would not suffer inconvenience. But Tamal Krishna, being very sensitive to Prabhupada's desires and experience in serving him, several times moved over and spoke with his spiritual master. Srila Prabhupada, he said, when you get to London, the devotees will be so pleased to see you. Yes, said Srila Prabhupada, it is good that we are going. Otherwise, Srila Prabhupada was mostly silent, meditating on Krishna and his mission of bringing love of Krishna to the world. The flight turned out to be an unusually exhaustive ordeal. When the plane landed in Rome, it was delayed there for four hours, and Srila Prabhupada had to wait in the airport lounge. When finally they arrived over London, the captain announced that they could not land yet due to the strike, and so they continued circling for hours. Finally, 24 hours after leaving Delhi, the plane landed at Heathrow Airport. Customs and immigration officials and the British Airways ground crew allowed Srila Prabhupada in a wheelchair to quickly pass through all the formalities. And soon he was admit, soon he was amid a throng of enthusiastic disciples, and then sitting in a white Rolls Royce en route to Bhaktivedanta Manor. The London airport and the busy highways leading into the city are certainly a great contrast to the peace and spirituality of Vrindavan. But for Srila Prabhupada to suddenly leave the climate and transcendental culture of India to fly to the West was not unusual. He had been doing that, going from east to west, from north to south, from one nation to another, to the snowlands, to the tropics, to the cities, to the jungles, mixing with white people, black people, and Orientals at an almost constant pace for years. He was no Hindu village guru, suddenly astounded to see hundreds of automobiles racing on the highway, or to see factory smoke or skyscrapers, or the blind rat race of the meat eaters. There was no question of culture shock for Srila Prabhupada. But there was a shock for his disciples in London, who had never imagined that he would be so thin, or that anyone could travel in such condition. 
For the devotees who had been at the airport to meet him, it had been a heart-rending experience. Even those who had heard the reports of Prabhupada Vrindavan were not emotionally prepared for such a change. Prabhupada was as transcendental as ever, or even more than ever, but the devotees were shocked at first to see him so different. Now he appeared like a powerful sage who had been undergoing long austerities for the benefit of humankind, and who had become transcendental to his body, although living within it. At Bhaktivinata Manasri, Prabhupada went from the car to a palanquin and entered the temple room, where about 300 disciples and well-wishers were waiting to be with him. Devotees from all the ISKCON centers in northern and southern Europe had rushed to England on a last-minute notice. They were holding kirtan for Srila Prabhupada as he entered, and they too, like the devotees at the airport, were deeply shocked. And for a moment, when they saw Srila Prabhupada wearing his dark sunglasses and appearing so thin, the kirtan almost stopped. Yet they simultaneously remained joyful and ecstatic, realizing that despite such difficulty, he had actually come to the West to be with them and encourage their Krishna consciousness. They had been praying for him for months. The prayer, my dear Lord Krishna, if you desire, please cure Srila Prabhupada, had been printed on a banner and hung over Srila Prabhupada's Vyasa son. The devotees of England wanting to reciprocate with Srila Prabhupada with more than just the sentiment of their words were also leading the world in transcendental book distribution. When a few weeks ago they had heard that Srila Prabhupada might be coming to England, it hadn't seemed possible considering his physical condition. They had heard he might leave his body at any moment, but then later they had heard he was better and he was coming to London. Even when he had heard he was definitely coming, they had been incredulous, but now it had come true. The Didi room curtains were open and Srila Prabhupada beheld Radhago Kulananda. Some devotees stood in front of him and with a small gesture characteristic of his hand, he waved them aside. In the morning, we should always be cautious that our backs are not to Prabhupada in front of his Vyasa son. When you're looking at the altar, you should be in line with the columns of the altar. Then you know that Prabhupada has clear vision. Imagine Prabhupada sitting on his palanquin and still he's telling his words. What did Prabhupada say? Like washing coal. I told this to Arjuna. Prabhupada said that on a hot mic moment. The devotees were doing something like that, blocking his view. And he mentioned, and it, was, it got caught in a tape recorder, he said, like washing coal. Everybody knows what coal is. In India, they call it cola. You can't wash it. Everything just becomes black and black and black. So trying to wash coal means it's almost futile. But nevertheless, he never stopped. He never gave up on us. Without any change of expression, he sat with concentrated attention facing the gorgeously dressed deities of Radha Gokul Ananda, who he had named four years ago when calling for them to come and be worshipped here by the devotees of England. Without saying a word, Prabhupada went up to his room where as many devotees as possible joined him. He had always said he felt comfortably at home in his quarters, and once again he was pleased to see outside his window the large lawn, the lake, and the ducks. The devotees sat before him with their palms folded, aware that this was no casual meeting. They had already offered their lives completely to Srila Prabhupada, and there was nothing more they could offer in words that would equal their dedication. Srila Prabhupada Ki! Reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 22, Text 16, The Marriage of Kardama Muni and Devahuti. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Kamak se boyang nara devatesha. Kamak se boyang nara devatesha. 
Kamakshabuya Naradevatesha Ultraya Samanaya Vido Pratita Putraya Samanaya Vido Pratita Kaevate Tanayang Nadriyeta Kaevate Tanayang Nadriyeta Svajava Kantya Shipatim Ivasayang Svajava Kantya Shipatim Ivasayang Please chant. Putraya Samanaya Vidobitita Kaevete Tanayam Nadrieta I have a Kantya Shipatim Ivasriyam Kamaksabuya Naradevatesha Purutraya Samanaya Vidopratita I have a Kantya Shipitim Ivasriyam Amaksabuya Naradevatesha Purutraya Samanaya Naevite Tanayam Nadrieta Naeva Kantya Shipatim Ivasriyam Naeva Kantya Shipatim Ivasriyam Amak Shibuya Naradevite Shriyam Purutra Shamanaya Vidopratita Kaevite Tanayam Nadrieta Kaeva Kantya Shipatim Ivasriyam Namak Shibuya Naradevatesha Putraya Samanaya Vidopatita Evite Tanayam Nadrieta Svayaeva Kantya Shipitim Ivasrayam Amak Sabuya Naradevatesha Putraya Samanaya Vidopatita Evite Tanayam Nadrieta I have a Kantya Shipitim Ivasrayam. Ladies. Kamak Sibuya Naradevatesha. Ultra Samanaya Vido Pratita. Kaevate Tanaya Nadrieta Sayaeva Kantya Shipitim Ivasrayam Kama Desire Sa That Buyat Let it be fulfilled Naradeva O King Te your Achya, this Purtya of the daughter Samanaya Vido, in the process of the Vedic scriptures, Pratita, recognized Ka, who, Eva, in fact, Te, your 
Danayam, daughter, Nadrieta, would not adore. Swaya, by her own, Eva, alone, Kantya, bodily lustre, Shipatim, excelling, Eva, as if, Shriyam, ornaments. Translation and purport by Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Let your daughter's desire for marriage, which is recognized in the Vedic scriptures, be fulfilled. Who would not accept her hand? She is so beautiful that by her bodily luster alone, she excels the beauty of her ornaments. Please repeat. Let your daughter's desire for marriage which is recognized in the Vedic scriptures, be fulfilled. Who would not accept her hand? She is so beautiful that by her bodily luster alone she excels the beauty of her ornaments. Purport. Gardama Muni wanted to marry Devahuti in the recognized manner of marriage prescribed in the scriptures. As stated in the Vedic scriptures, the first class process is to call the bridegroom to the home of the bride and hand her to him in charity with a dowry of necessary ornaments, gold, furniture, and other household paraphernalia. This form of marriage is prevalent among higher class Hindus even today and is declared in the Shastras to confer great religious merit on the bride's father. To give a daughter in charity to a suitable son-in-law is considered to be one of the pious activities of a householder. There are eight forms of marriage mentioned in the scripture, Manusmriti, in the scripture Manusmriti, but only one process of marriage, Brahma or Rajasika marriage is now current. Other kinds of marriage, by love, by exchange of garlands, or by kidnapping the bride are now forbidden in this age of Kali. Formerly, Chatriyas would at their pleasure kidnap a princess from another royal house, and there would be a fight between the Chatriya and the girl's family. Then if the kidnapper was the winner, the girl would be offered to him for marriage. Even Krishna married Rukmini by that process, and some of his sons and grandsons also married by kidnapping. Krishna's grandsons kidnapped Duryodhana's daughter, which caused a fight between the Kuru and the Yadu families. Afterward, an adjustment was made by the elderly members of the Kuru family. Such marriages were current in bygone ages. But at the present moment, they are impossible because the strict principles of Chaturya life have practically been abolished. Since India has become dependent on foreign countries, the particular influence of our social orders have been lost now, according to the scriptures, everyone is a Shudra. The so-called Brahmanas, Chatriyas, and Vaishyas have forgotten their traditional activities. And in the absence of these activities, they are called Shudras. It is said in the scriptures, Kalo Shudra Sambhavaha. In the age of Kali, everyone will be like Shudras. The traditional social customs are not followed in this age, although formally they were followed strictly. Oma Gyana Tamanda Shagana Jashlaka Chakshwam by Tamina Tasma Shrigar Veda Maham Mukam Karati Vachalam Pangoman Kai Tegar Mirki Pitamaham Bade Shrigarum Dira Tanam So just see the difference between uh, the consideration for marriage in Kali Yuga because we know that it's only based on this uh, superficial external attraction, body to body. There's no consideration for the actual merit of the activity itself, you know, what it means not just to the individual, but as described, but to society. And there's considerable discussion, you know, in the battlefield, just imagine, on the battlefield, Krishna dedicates time to explain to Arjuna that, or Arjuna is complaining that this will happen, that if the uh, women, the widows, uh, will be unprotected 
And in that unprotected state, they may become prey to rascals and rogues, and therefore they'll be, uh, what is it? Varna Shankara, unwanted progeny, which is what we see more or less today. Of course, Krishna is not taking these social conventions as uh, meritorious arguments, but it's addressed because it is actual, at least Arjuna is thinking that there will be some consequence either way. I think he might have thought that Krishna would be swayed by this. At least that's what it appears. Otherwise, why bring up such an argument? In, in all of his efforts, he's simply trying to get Krishna to let him have his own way and retreat from the battlefield. So this is, uh, this is common. When someone doesn't want to do something, they find some excuse. Sometimes it has some superficial merit. It sounds nice. I don't want to kill my kinsmen, you know, because, you know, they'll be, the women will be unprotected. So yeah, it sounds logical. That's a good one. But ultimately, Krishna prevails. And in opening up Arjuna's eyes, that this is not your primary consideration as a chakriya. His primary consideration is to establish righteousness, to do the right thing. Not, that's the principle. And so acting on principle, so chakriyas have no real choice. Just like in so many other ways, they have, a, like they cannot refuse a fight. And here, this is the first principle, and here he is trying to refuse a fight. If they're challenging a fight, they cannot refuse, regardless of the consequences. Uh, if a suitable uh, woman is offered to them for whatever reason, they must accept. They cannot reject. So there's so many different things that, that Chaturya has as his duty that cannot be done in Kali Yuga. But yet the principle remains that there are certain rules and regulations, just like we have our rules and regulations. So every varna, every ashram has its rules and regulations. And those must be, just like when you become, take a government post, you have to take, you have to read an oath, put your hand on the Bible. I swear to defend and protect the constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. So that's your duty. You cannot, just say, well, under these circumstances, I won't follow this duty. No. Even in this kind, there's an oath of allegiance that says that everything accrued during my tenure, because, you know, not the Brahmacharya, who only has two dotis and two kurtas, but if you're the Tamil president and your name is on some property or you've bought some vehicles, it says that this all belongs to Krishna. It's not mine. For some reason, my post is no longer there for whatever reason. I don't get to keep the cars or the, or the property or the anything else like some have considered in the past. Yes, that cannot be done. So there is an oath. And Prabhupada was very conscious. He, he personally dictated the outline of this oath. Because as the movement was increasing, he saw that there could be some some uh, manipulation. So he wasn't just thinking that everything is, you know, transcendental. It is. But as the Acharya, it's his duty to set the example. And so the example was he dictated the oath of allegiance that every temple president must sign and have notarized or have two witnesses. It basically says, my allegiance belongs to his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. I promise you around today, follow four hundred principles, and not to steal, essentially. Very one devotee, temple president, who left the temple and took a sum of money. When it came to Prabhupada's attention, he had just received that devotee's oath of allegiance. And then he turned and told Tamaka, he said, immediately prosecute. It's like all the devotees like that. He said, immediately prosecute. Prabhupada was not a sentimentalist. You know, if there's a cancer in the body, the surgeon cuts it out. He doesn't leave it and say, well, let's just wait and 
see what happens. No, he, he's preemptive in that sense that he can understand that the cancer will spread, it will grow. It's not going to get smaller unless you do something radical by either cutting out or removing it or putting some chemo or some other application of radiation and whatnot. Because otherwise the inevitable result is death. So they make some attempt, that's there. So Prabhupada didn't want this mentality to spread. That people became complacent or worse. So we also have to be practical. You know, we're hearing about kings and sages and how they're acting according to the social interactions. So this is, this is what you expect in any society. So our society is no different. We have our interactions amongst the various levels of management and rank and file. And everyone is expected to do his duty. If not, then there's difficulty. Someone doesn't show up on time to do the offering, either to cook it, to offer it to their lordships. And there's, you can understand it, there's some convenience. You know, if we think that this is just a stone statue, he's not going to mind one, two minutes, I can be late for Krishna. Would you be late for someone that you think? It's like if I have to approach someone for a favor, I'm not going to be late. I'm going to be punctual. So how much more punctual we should be when the Supreme Personality of God is waiting for his offering or his arti or anything. So that we have to cultivate. That relationship is real. And if you treat it in a very casual way, then the real relationship will never manifest within the heart. That's just a fact. It can't. So everything we do has to be tinged with that uh, premanjana trita bhakti balochanena, that salve of love. It may not be on that highest level, but it should be in the beginning level at least. Now let me try to do things to the best of my capacity, uh, to please Krishna, to please Prabhupada. That's all. It doesn't have to be with the full emotion that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is manifesting. And all the tears constantly flow when I chant your holy name, yes. But the ideal is there. So one should chant very feelingly. Prabhupada said, like a child crying for its mother. Feelingly, not mechanically, feelingly. one time in the Henry Street Temple, because devotees knew my background, not, it wasn't very flattering. The temple president asked me, I need you to check this one devotee, whether he's chanting his, his rounds. That was my first detective assignment. And so, you know, I, I, he asked, and I was just wondering exactly, but that's okay. The temple president asked me, I should do it. I monitored this devotee's japa. And it was terrible japa. It was the worst japa you've ever heard. Stick a stick around, stick a stick around, stick a stick around. And he would finish in 45 minutes. I would say, Prabhu, you finished? Yeah, finished my 16 rounds. 45 minutes. It's impossible. Not possible. So I told the town president. He said, oh, okay. You know, not much else you could do. He went, he spoke to him and like that, but he didn't correct him. Eventually, the devotee didn't stay because his rounds were not quality. He was trying to make some adjustment, at least in his mind. I have, okay, they told me I have to finish 16 rounds. Okay, I'm going to finish 16 rounds my way. No, but you can't do that. It doesn't have the effect. Superficially, you may satisfy someone. What does they say in the material world? You can all the people some of the time and some of the people all of the time. But you can't fool all of the people all of the time. Right? But people will try. And that's also an example for us. We should not... We're here to evolve our consciousness, not to degrade it. Not that you come to a spiritual movement and you take shortcuts just to satisfy the authorities, and just to check the box. Yeah, I finished my rounds. No, it's... That's not the point of spiritual life. The point of spiritual life is purification, real a desire and a determination 
and perseverance to do the right thing. All right, so there's a, we had a nice program last night at 26 Second Avenue. It's always a pleasure to be there. Where Prabhupada basically gave birth to this movement. And so the whole, the building is infused with Prabhupada's presence. It's, that's the Tadiyanam. Tadiyanam means that which is connected to the deity or the spiritual master. When you understand that, you treat the paraphernalia differently because you appreciate that this actually has a genuine connection. I may not be able to physically see it, but it's like Prabhupada's shoes in the museum. That's Tadiyanam. This is special. He wore those shoes all around, New all, onto the Jaladuta, off the Jaladuta, all around New York for a full year before, before finally someone said, you know, you know, a thought to give, to offer. Before Prabhupada, he wouldn't even spend the money on himself. These shoes are worn through. There's holes in the bottom. He put cardboard inside them. He had scotch tape on them. Walking around in the New York City winter. You know, and this is, so we should appreciate to, that, to what extent you know, Srila Prabhupada uh, sacrificed for us, and those shoes represent that sacrifice, and that's to Dhyanam. Okay, so that's why there's, if you have darshan of those shoes, if you're fortunate enough to have them touched to your head, it's a very special thing. It's not it's putting Prabhupada's lotus feet, this is directly, it's not different. You know, that's, in uh, certain religions, they have, all over India, you'll see they have these tombs. But the body is not inside. There's some relic. Like in, uh, they're called Dant Samadhi. You know Dant Samadhi? They have Buddha's tooth, supposedly. One of the Buddha's teeth. Dant means tooth. So a Dant Samadhi, a huge stupa, and inside is supposedly Lord Brahma's tooth. Not Lord Brahma, Lord Buddha's tooth. Lord Brahma must have many teeth, right? Four heads on this universe. It's a lot of teeth. We can make a Don Samadhi from Gopal. He's one of his, he used one of his wisdom teeth. So that, they have all still in Vrindavan. You'll go and there's all these different Samadhis and you wonder, why does this person have so many Samadhis? Because this one is for the tooth, this one is for something else, and they like that. Just like in Mayapur, we have a Pushpa Samadhi. The garland from Prabhupada's, you know, when he was put into Samadhi, those flower garland, not all of them, but some of the flowers are taken to Mayapur and interred there. So it's not different. When you go into Prabhupada's Samadhi in Mayapur, you don't feel that there's a, a huge difference. Maybe for those who know that, you know, the Vrindavan Samadhi is special, they appreciate that there's a slight difference. But for others, the potency is there. So this, this tadiyanam, so we have to develop our consciousness in such a way that we always have this sense of connection and that we're always thinking, how can I advance that consciousness so that it becomes full? I mean, at, at what point? You know, we're always thinking, we hear, you know, full Krishna consciousness, you know, which is the definition technically of samadhi. But it can only be achieved by remaining on a certain platform for a certain length of time. It's not, it doesn't just happen overnight. And all of a sudden you reach Samadhi and somebody hands you a certificate, like the Bhakti Shastri or the Bhakti Bhaibhava, and say, oh, here you go. Here's your Samadhi certificate. We can give it to people who sleep in Bhagavatam class. We give it, here's your Samadhi certificate. Obviously you've achieved Samadhi because you can sleep in Bhagavatam class. And there's that uh, interaction between Srila Prabhupada and Jamuna. And uh, the devotees, Prabhupada said, why are you sleeping in class? Go up to the room. And after that devotee left, Prabhupada questioned why, why everyone, why they're sleeping. And, uh, you know, Mother Jamuna offered an excuse and somebody else offered an excuse. And 
the bottom line is that, you know, because people, are, the devotees are tired, they're working hard, it's different, it's India, it's this, it's that, the other thing. You can always stand, and Prabhupada would say, you hear it sometimes in a lecture, Prabhupada would say, stand. And you wonder, oh, what does he mean? He's, he's telling a sleeping devotee to stand. Just like when he says, sit properly, he's not telling that devotee to sit with a straight back, he was telling that devotee not to shake his leg. You know, the devotee was sitting there chanting Japanese like this, and Prabhupada said, sit properly. Some devotees, and whenever, if you hear that on tape, probably they sit up like that, but that's not what Prabhupada was, you know, he was telling that devotee to stop shaking his leg. So, it, it'll inevitably happen at some point. So, if you're too tired to listen, then you stand. It's just, that's a simple solution right there. No more sleeping. So we have to have, we have to be serious that if I want to hear it, it's like we all wanted to hear Srila Prabhupada. And many of us were exhausted from working all night to prepare for Prabhupada's arrival. And so it was inevitable that, you know, for, for many of us, we were standing. And that was okay. There was no problem. Prabhupada didn't mind. He did not mind in the least if you're standing. He never said, sit down. Never heard him on a class say, sit down. Stand up, yes. Sit properly, yes. Sit down, no. So many of us would stand. Because it demonstrated that we were a little bit serious about the situation. That we wanted to hear. It was like Srila Prabhupada, like Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Goswami Prabhupada. He mocked Prabhupada that he doesn't go away, he listens. Uh, so that should be, at least, that should be something that we can say, that I, I listened with full attention, as much as possible. When you're washing the pots, it's hard to give. You know, you're hearing, but it's not full attention. You know, when you're working with a table saw, it's not full attention. The sound vibration is there, but it's not, because you have to concentrate on what you're doing, otherwise you'll lose a few fingers. You know, but still the sound vibration is there. And it shows that rather than just let my mind, you know, run away on its own wherever, that I want to at least have the uh, spiritual master's transcendental sound vibration entering into my ears. Because the effect is purifying whether I understand it or not. Even if it's in Hindi. Prabhupada has many lectures even in Hindi. You can listen to these lectures. It's not that they're not potent. He's saying the same thing. Uh, this is Chite Te Kuriya Aikya. So what, you know, we have, we make a distinction. Oh, I, I, this, is, this is different. It's, no, it's non-different. You know, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, it's Sanskrit. Does it make a difference? No. Nama chintamani krishna chaitanya rasa vigraha. Nama shuddha purna mukta binat bam nama namino. Completely transcendental. The name is not different from Krishna's form, his pastimes, his, paraphr his paraphernalia. Not different. So all this paraphernalia is not different from Krishna. So we have to treat it as such, take good care of everything. And that goes for the vehicles too. That's the same. It's not different from, you know, the Lord's cups on the altar. It all belongs to the Lord. Doesn't matter if, a, if it's a cup or a car. And to the extent that we make this distinction, then we remain in somewhat material consciousness. <clears throat> it's duality. Duality is there. <clears throat> so we have to guard ourselves. It's not a constant thing. We just have to recognize that. That, you know, why am I not taking care of why am I leaving the car dirty, you know, or leaving the tank empty, you know? Would you give Krishna half a cup of water on the altar? Would you? No, you'd give a full cup, of course. I wouldn't say, let me just put half a cup. Krishna, will, you'd be satisfied, like Sanatana Goswami, you know. Sanatana Goswami was living under a tree. He had no means. He was bhikshu baba. He was whatever people would give him. 
And so the deity was complaining, you're giving me dry chapatis, no ghee, not even salt, not even salt, a little salt you should give. <laughs> He's having this interaction with Krishna. Because these go strong, this is not ordinary pastimes. The more you read, the more you realize that how this transcendental nature exists, coexists simultaneously. Everything is here. Prabhupada, the devotees complained, was, Srila Prabhupada was sorry that we couldn't fill the hall with people. They had, had a program and nobody came. And it's empty seats. And they were disappointed. They were disappointed for Srila Prabhupada that he came. And I said, he, said, he said, the demigods are listening. They're here. So this is that transcendental vision that one is never thinking that uh, and ultimately he also said he's never alone. His spirit, he's always with his spiritual master. He was never alone. And this was a, this is a genuine. He's telling us these things. They're secrets. You know that he's revealing himself. Like it said here in the Lilamrita, that one should not try to understand the mind of a Vaishnava. Because it becomes offensive. You're trying to think. But he was revealing his mind to the devotees. But not in an ostentatious, artificial way just to impress somebody. It was very sweet and nonchalant. And you had to be in tuned, attuned to appreciate this intimacy that Srila Prabhupada had with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, but also, you know, we have a, and depending on our consciousness, we appreciate it or not, to whatever degree. And to the degree we appreciate it, to that extent, we can also hope to achieve that state at some point. Not immediately, maybe not in this lifetime. But he was demonstrating how it is a fact. He was demonstrating how it was a fact. But, uh, yeah, so there are so many social considerations. And our social consideration is how do we develop this relationship with the spiritual master? So this is also a very intimate union between the spiritual master and the disciple. And one should accept it in that mood of seriousness. Just as if we were, you were getting married. In many respects, it's much more important uh, socially and spiritually than the union between a man and a woman. What's that verse? Atak pumbir dvija shrestha varnashama vibhaga saha sunustatasya dhamasya sangsidhya haritoshanam doesn't say, oh, Brahmana, you must get married and satisfy this woman. No, it says whatever you are, whatever your duties you think as a Brahmin that you must fulfill, unless you satisfy the Krishna, there's nothing. It's useless. And that, what's that next verse? Shrama eva hi kevalam. Useless waste of time. Useless waste of time. So it must satisfy Krishna or it's a useless waste of time. So in this way, we have an opportunity somehow or other. Is it not working? No. It's working? Okay, good. And everything we do, just like it says, what is that? Yat karoshi yas nasi yat jahoshi didasi yat. Everything, whatever you eat, even at that point, whatever you eat, whatever you offer, whatever you give away, whatever austerities you perform, whatever penance you should perform, whatever sacrifice you perform, everything has to be done as an offering to Krishna. We're offering it. This is also an, an exchange. It's like when we have a fire sacrifice. and You chant the mantras. The fire represents Vishnu. And we're putting in the seed grains. What do the seed grains represent in many respects? 
First of all, you're feeding Vishnu. He eats through the fire. He eats through the mouths of the Brahmins. But also, sinful acts are, why do we abstain from grains on a codice? One story is that sinful sin takes shelter in grains. So this exact, you can look it up in the Akadasi book, and there's a pastime, having to do something with Lord Indra. He's also always in, involved in some of these stories like this. He's always getting into trouble. Indra is always getting into trouble, you know? Stopping Govardhan ceremonies. Just, uh, anyway, he's always in trouble. He's the king of heaven, but he's, he's, he's almost like he's clueless at times doing certain things. And of course, this is Krishna's pastimes. Some mercy on him also. But we have to be, uh, we have to have some, we have to appreciate what's being given to us in the scriptures from many different levels. It's not just that there's a story involved for our hearing pleasure. No, but there's a lesson. Everything is a lesson. There are examples. Otherwise, why are they taking the time to compile why would the Vaishnavas not giving their proper respect? Because they didn't have a commentary on the Srimad Bhagavatam. Everyone knows that story, right? You don't know that story, Bhakti Fred? The Vaishnavas had no commentary on the Srimad Bhagavatam. All the other so-called, you know, different sects had given some interpretation, but it wasn't, it wasn't true to the, uh, how can you say it? the literal meaning of the Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam means about Krishna. Yeah? About Krishna, spoken by Krishna, I've spoken about Krishna. So one guru, you can see from Prabhupada in the beginning of the introduction, says to Baladev Bijibhushan. Okay, so Baladev Bijibhushan, there was a, he was residing in a hermitage. Do you know where that hermitage was? You don't know this pastime? They spoke to the Bhagavatam, you don't know where that was? Not Naima Sharanya. This commentary is in Jaipur, there's a hermitage called Galta, Galtaji. There's a few very special things about Galtaji. At one point, there was some challenge about the sanctity of this place, whether it was suitable for hearing the Bhagavatam, because there, there's no, there's no rivers in Jaipur. Jaipur is in the middle of a desert. So Mother Ganges manifest from the top of a cliff at the top of a mountain. You don't expect this is totally, you know, out of the norm. The water gushing forth out of the top. So this is Galta G. Galta has another meaning also. There's some that... I forget at this point. But anyway, so there's, you go up the mountain, you go up through the mountains in Jaipur, you come to this Galtaji, and it's a very ancient hermitage. All the cells are carved out of solid rock. And you can imagine, and there's many, so it was a thriving community of sadhus at the time of Baladeva Jibhushan. And it, it, they challenged you, so he left the assembly because he, he, he couldn't speak because they said, you don't have a commentary. How can you speak? What can you do? So what is the commentary named? What is the commentary? What is the Vaishnav commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam called? Govinda Basya. Govinda Basya. Why? Because in that desire to stand up for the Vaishnavas, to properly represent them, Baladeva Vijayabhasana prayed that it, it, this is impossible, Krishna, what, what to do? <laughs> Krishna personally appeared and dictated this commentary. So therefore we have, because otherwise it's impossible. Just like we see that Krishna Das Kaviraj, who's 90 years old, he's infirm, practically blind, and he wrote Chaitanya Charitamrita. So Baladeva Jibhasana, he prayed, and Lord Krishna appeared to save the reputation of the Vaishnavas and dictated Govinda Basya. And you can go to that place, beautiful place, one of the most beautiful places in India, spiritually beautiful. And the Ganges water is still flowing constantly from the top of this cliff. Now it comes out of a Gomukh. So 
just like in Michigan, they have a carved marble cow head and the water comes forth from the mouth. Go mook. Mook means mouth, go means cow. And you can jump off the cliff, not now, I don't know what now, but when we were Brahmachars, no fear. 25, 30 feet up the side of the cliff, jump off into this deep pool at the bottom. Amazing. I hope you get the chance sometime before you get too old. So you can experience this, all these nectar places. Don't forget the name, Galta G, G-A-L-T-A, G. So there's many uh, ways, opportunities to remember Krishna. Going to the holy places in, is another. Going to places like Jaipur. Everywhere you go, Krishna's there. In the most, any, it's, it, walking down one street there, this, and all the temples there, Gopinath is there, and around the corner is uh, uh, Radha Vinod, Radha Damodar, Radha Vrindavan Chandra. It's all in Jaipur, and of course, Radha Govinda. Yeah. So all there within a few blocks. You can go to all the temples. You can go to Mangalarti, go to Sringarti, go to every temple. In a very simple, very amazing Jaipur, so beautiful. So, we'll read the translation again. Let your daughter's desire for marriage, which is recognized in the Vedic scriptures, be fulfilled. Who would not accept her hand? She is so beautiful that by her bodily luster alone, she excels the beauty of her ornaments. So, this is also like the disciple coming before the spiritual master. You know, he has the opportunity. We see that spiritual masters, his beauty is measured by his devotion to Krishna, his knowledge that he imparts to us, the example that he sets for us. These things are more than ornaments. You know, sadhu Bhushanam. These are the jewels of the sadhu, the 26 qualities. And if one is fortunate to recognize them and, and make this vow, just like a marriage vow, then he will be protected. His, his connection to the spiritual master will always be his primary interest, never to disappoint, never to cheat, never to be unfaithful, uh, never to do anything that will disturb the relationship. Why would you want to disturb such a relationship? Hmm? that is so rarely achieved, and from which everything springs. Otherwise, how could we have access to this knowledge? From which, just by coming in contact, if one is just in a regular fashion, like probably gave us the spiritual program, Srimad Bhagavatam class in the morning, does not require any other extra endeavor, technically. Yes, one should fulfill satisfy his desires to hear and chant to whatever extent he can. But even if one is just attending the Srimad Bhagavatam class, that is sufficient for God-realization. And that is described. It says that if one reads the first nine cantos, it doesn't read or hear. If you hear long enough, now we're on third canto. Soon we'll be on fourth canto. Soon we'll be on ninth canto. It says that if one hears ninth canto, up to the ninth, first nine cantos, in the proper mood, and he will be self-realized. It doesn't have to take nine cantos, you know. Right? One can become self-realized almost instantly, Prabhupada said. He said, why one minute, one moment, one moment, gave that famous pronouncement from the Asana in Australia. People were asking questions, how long does it take? And he said, it can just take one minute. And then he changed, said, why one minute, one moment? What's the definition of a moment? We said it the other day in class. Well, maybe we didn't. It's in the prayers by Lord Brahma, 
He steals the cows and cowherd boys. He disappears for a year. One moment of Brahma's time. But it's the same for him as it is for us. It's one eleventh of a second. Uh, sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Sastra Koi. Lava Matra, Sadhu Sangha. Lava Matra is a moment. One moment's association. So one moment's association is one eleventh of a second. If you just saw Prabhupada, so somehow or other, and we, we didn't know. We saw Prabhupada walking around the streets of New York City. We had no idea what's going on. We were oblivious. Just another backdrop to New York scene. You know, so we didn't know he was a sadhu. We didn't know, you know, so many things are going on. Just a phenomena. Something different. But who knows? Does that count as a moment's association? The spiritual master is not an ordinary person. Waves of devotion are emanating from his person. It's just like uh, when you go to Washington Square Park on 420, what do you get? What do you get? You get a contact high. That's the terminology. Contact high. You know, you're not smoking it directly, but you're surrounded in this atmosphere of ignorance and you get intoxicated by the this, by this smell because it's all... So who knows what the potency is of the pure devotee? Just by seeing him. Just by seeing him. So, Robert said, if a person even just touches the book. I don't, and didn't he say also, if you just see the book? Yeah. Because this is Krishna. That person is having darshan. He doesn't know it. Maybe we don't even fully realize it. But this is not different from Krishna. So if he sees it, we're bringing darshan right to the person on the street. He's seeing the deity. You know? How does that designation go? That which, how many, which, you know, the first canto was the Lord's lotus feet. So this is the beginning. So everyone is, we're distributing the Srimad Bhagavatam first canto. Distributing the Bhakti stack, right? Isn't that one of the ones that we used to make the, or is that the, uh, that's the Sapta. The Sapta has the Bhagavatam in it. So very interesting how effective and potent this movement is. Because everything is connected to Krishna. Even the devotees. They're connected to Krishna. And so therefore, when, how does the Hari Nam? It's, yes, it's Krishna's name. But it's also the devotees in their tilak and their dhotis and their saris. They're representing Krishna, and so they're carrying that potency with them. It's like a moving embassy of the spiritual world. It's like they have, uh, they have mobile libraries. They have mobile vaccination clinics. It's terrible. They have all these mobile things nowadays. Mobile court system. I saw it the other day. It's the first time I've seen it. They had a mobile court. I guess if you did something wrong or whatever, or you needed help, you could just go in there and ask a question. So, so that's a, so everything. So the, but where the, the uh, original moving em, uh, embassy of the spiritual world through the, the Sankirtan party, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So that's, that's our duty, that's our burden that this has to be continued at all costs, and that should always be there. It's, no one should be thinking that we can ignore this aspect or that aspect, no. Everything must go on at all costs. That's our attitude. Circumstantially, some things may be there. That's, and probably I would see that, you know. If you can't do this, you do this. If you can't do this, you do this. But we take it that unless otherwise, we have the full program, you know, especially we have Radha Govinda, Radha Krishna, Gornitai, Giriraj, and Govinda Shila. We cannot be deficient in our devotion. We have to increase more and more. Right. Any questions or comments? Bhakti Raya? 
I was counting on Dr. Ryan to give me a, a stimulating question. About why we, here we are, why, why, such, why are we li reading in the Bhagavatam that the marriage of Kardama Muni and Devahuti? What does this have to do with God realization? Kapila was born this way. Okay. Kapila was born, okay. But why do we just skip right to, you know, Kapila? Why do we have to hear about the backstory? His desire to kill her because he's connecting with Krishna, it purifies the whole situation and makes the God come. All these connections are there, but I mean, still, I, you know, we're reading about this, the, these social customs. Of course, that's there because we also need to reestablish Varnashram. So this is re giving us the, uh, the means to do it, to have the right method and mentality in order to come. So once we know that this is how it should be done, then eventually it can be put into effect. Eventually, not immediately. But look how many things have been put into effect already. Before Prabhupada came, being a vegetarian was not a very common thing. Somehow or other, by that subtle influence, an entire generation of people became sensitive and questioned. And eventually they became, at least externally, on a platform where animals at least were reduced in slaughter. Not eliminated, but reduced. People were elevated in consciousness towards nonviolence. So these things are there. So, I'm, and we even see fashion-wise, you know, in the Los Angeles Temple, the Vasha tell me they sell, you know, upwards of a million dollars a year in mostly fashion-related items, not Joppa beats. They sell to, you know, normal people who walk in, they sell them, they sell saris and Harinam chatters and Quarters and things like that, yogi pants. Because it, and it's all become popularized by the Hare Krishnas, more or less. You know? We saw Prabhupada complaining in the Lilamata previously that because of India's you know, a f connection with the West, all these things went down. And then Prabhupada came to the West and he brought them back up in America. Those, this is just one simple example that one can appreciate how this culture has already affected Western civilization in a positive way. And how much more it will impact as we continue to spread the Yuga Dharma, the chanting of Hare Krishna, everywhere. Just a matter of time. It was like Prabhupada said to Mr. Rubin on the uh, as related in the Lilamrita, he was an MTA worker. I don't know if he was a bus driver or a subway conductor, but he was somebody connected with the MTA. And he relates that this gentleman spoke as if he had temples everywhere. <laughs> and Prabhupada basically told him, yes, only separated by time. So that's also our consideration. If people say, no, you can't do it, you're thinking too big, don't do it like that. No, Prabhupada wanted big temples. He said that. And when he finished in that pastime in Vrindavan, when he's finished Krishna Balaram, he said, therefore, we were. Okay, he said, primary is book distribution, because he's after saying that we want big, big temples, not just in India, he didn't say in, he didn't say in India, he said we want big, big temples for people to come, to impress upon them. And everything should be there. At different times, he also said, we have enough temples. But that was when we had the big temples. Now we don't have that big temple anymore. So we have to put it back. Right? And Dr. Ryan's going to help. And you won't have to carry sheetrock up four flights of stairs. We'll have an elevator. We'll have a boom crane delivering it. Any other questions? Shrimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Sri Sri Radha Gundadev ki, Gaur Premanandi. 
Srila Prabhupada Ki.